Good evening. My name is Sandra Fritz. I'm the chairperson of the Shrewsbury School Committee and welcome to our meeting of April 15th. Tonight's virtual meeting is being broadcast live on cell phone channels 29 and 329 and shared live on Shrewsbury Media Connections website. It will be rebroadcast between now and our next regularly scheduled meeting on May 6th. The public participation portion of our meeting is suspended as this is a virtual meeting. However, the public can email the school committee with any questions or comments they have at school committee at shoesbury.k12.ma.us. First on the agenda is chairperson and members report. Does anyone have anything this evening? Nope, I don't see anyone. Next is superintendent's report. Thank you, Ms. Fritz. Uh, as we continue with uh, the uh, school closure due to the coronavirus pandemic, um, I just want to again thank uh, everyone uh, in our, who was part of our school community. Thank you to our families uh, and parents for supporting their children at home. Thank you for our students uh, who are working hard to connect uh, with the learning that we're being provided that's being provided to them. Uh, I want to thank our staff. Uh, who are working uh, very hard in a very different way uh, to try to provide the best opportunities possible under the circumstances. Um, and I also want to thank our leadership team in particular. Um, they have had to pull together a, a very significant amount of new ways of, of doing things in a short amount of time. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate the, the thoughtfulness uh, with which they are communicating and the uh, the leadership they're providing uh, to their various staffs in the buildings and their departments. Uh, so thank you to everyone for the efforts you're making. Um, I also wanna thank our community members uh, who are uh, practicing social distancing. I think we're starting to hopefully see uh, the flattening of the curve uh, happen. Uh, we know that this is uh, difficult, but necessary. Um, so thank you to everyone who is uh, uh, changing their, their habits so that we can uh, minimize the impact uh, of this terrible disease. Um, and finally, I want to uh, give my uh, condolences to the families in Shrewsbury that have been negatively affected uh, by this, including losing loved ones uh, as a result of, of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, all that said, uh, in terms of other news uh, for the school district, I do want to publicly announce this evening and share some news that uh, Mrs. Wendy Bell, who is the principal at Patton School, shared with her school community today. Uh, Ms. Bell uh, has been the principal now for a number of years at Patton and uh, has spent uh, two decades here in the district. Patton, in, in fact, is the only school she's ever worked at in a professional capacity as a teacher um, and now as principal. Um, she's uh, had a, a very, very positive impact on the Patton school community in both of those roles. Um, and today she announced that uh, effective for next year, uh, as of July 1st, uh, she'll be leaving Patton to become the principal at the Memorial School in Upton. Uh, which is part of the Mendon Upton School District. Uh, Ms. Bell sent a, uh, a very uh, thoughtful message uh, out to her parent community today uh, where she cited uh, the fact that this was a, a, not only a good professional opportunity for her, uh, but personally uh, the fact that uh, the Memorial School is only a five minute commute from her house and will enable her to be connected more with her uh, children and family uh, during uh, as part of uh, the balancing of her professional and, and uh, family roles uh, was, was attractive to her. Uh, the, the Memorial School in Upton is very fortunate to get such a strong school leader um, in Wendy Bell. She's uh, done some superb work uh, here in Shrewsbury. Uh, certainly, I thank her not only as superintendent, uh, but I had uh, the good fortune to have uh, all three of my daughters go through the Patton School for their elementary experience and experienced uh, working with Ms. Bell either as a teacher or a principal. Um, and uh, so I know from both perspectives how successful she's been and what a strong school community she's continued to help build. Um, uh, we will be looking, of course, at what uh, the, the right uh, approach to take is under the current circumstances in order to find uh, the next principal of Patton School. And uh, we'll be, I'll be working with uh, Barb Malone, our Executive Director of Human Resources, uh, to determine what the best next steps are. And I'll be in touch with the Patton community um, in the very near future regarding um, how we'll proceed. Uh, but we, of course, uh, wish Ms. Bell well in her next uh, role. She'll be with us, of course, for the rest of this school year. And I know she communicated that she's hopeful that we'll be back uh, and together somehow uh, physically before she moves on uh, to, uh, to the uh, Memorial School in Upton. So I wanted to make sure that the community uh, did get that message this evening. And that is superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. 
our first time scheduled appointment, uh, we will have an update from Dr. Soria regarding the school district's response to the COVID-19 school closure. Thank you. And I'm gonna share some slides here. So if you let me bring that up on the screen. Give me one moment here, here we go. And All right, so just checking to make sure you can see that slide. People can see that? Okay. Yes. Um, so I'm going to start off here and then share uh, this presentation uh, with some of my administrative colleagues. Uh, let me first start again with the, the key messages that we have been uh, communicating uh, since the school closure began. Um, of course, that the health and well-being of our students, families, and staff is our first priority. Um, that of course, this is an extraordinary time and that everyone in our community has a collective responsibility to respond uh, to the challenge that's before us. Um, and of course, even though our schools are physically closed, we will continue to support our students, our families and staff um, from a distance and empower continued student learning. Um, and there'll be, of course, a very detailed report this evening from Ms. Cloud O'Reek with regard to our remote learning plan. Um, a few key facts I wanna uh, share with the community. Um, again, the governor has closed all uh, schools in Massachusetts through May 1st with a reopening date no sooner than Monday, May 4th. Um, however, uh, it is widely believed, and, and I uh, also uh, agree that uh, it is uh, more than likely uh, that the governor will extend that closure beyond May 1st. Um, the question will be how much further beyond that. Um, and uh, based on information we received from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, um, it's likely that we'll get an update regarding uh, any extension of school closure sometime early next week. Um, as soon as we hear that news, of course, we'll share it with the school community. Our district continues to function remotely. Uh, we have been from the get-go providing meals uh, to students who require them, both uh, in a pickup mode at Shrewsbury High School, and in some cases, delivering to families that otherwise would not be able to access them. Uh, we have the remote learning program in place. It's been expanded twice since we began the closure period uh, into what is now its current iteration. Um, technology is something we're providing to families that require that uh, because they don't have access, whether that's access to devices or to the internet. Um, to date, we have uh, distributed 58 iPads with Wi-Fi uh, capability and also nine iPads with cellular service. And uh, more of those are on the way to families who have identified themselves as requiring that. And I appreciate Brian LaRue, our Director of uh, Information Technology and his team for making that happen. Um, today, we actually, uh, in some sense of normalcy, although a little different than typical, we shared uh, report cards. Um, the second trimester had just ended when the closure began, uh, and we did uh, have to make some adjustments, but we provided those grades and uh, comments for families um, through the online PowerSchool parent portal, so the uh, elementary and middle school families were able to access their students' grades for trimester two uh, as of today. Uh, we also uh, are continuing our, our finance operations, human resources functions. Those responsibilities are being carried out uh, with uh, staff being uh, doing that work remotely wherever possible. Uh, we have been providing online professional development specifically to our paraprofessionals uh, for a variety of training that's been quite successful um, and well-crafted by uh, some of uh, many members of our special education team along with uh, the assistant principals at Sherwood Middle School, uh, Karen Gudekanst and Heather Kowalski. Um, and a, a team of folks that have been providing different things and more of that's to come. Uh, Mrs. Clowder and Shauna Powers, the Director of Instructional Technology, uh, sought feedback from the staff relative to what kinds of professional development would be working best for them in terms of uh, gaining more expertise using various remote learning tools, and that's underway and evolving as uh, we work through those issues. Uh, and the construction of the new Beale School, there was a meeting of the Beale School Building Committee last night um, that construction continues. Uh, fortunately, because of the uh, very mild winter that uh, we had been very, very much uh, making excellent progress. Um, right now, things have slowed quite a bit uh, because the uh, uh, Carpenters Union statewide has chosen to stop work, um, which has uh, uh, put a pause on a variety of uh, uh, construction elements that otherwise would be happening right now, but we are uh, still in a good place relative to that schedule. Um, and obviously we'll monitor closely how that evolves depending on when those things can start back up. Uh, with different elements of that project. 
Uh, Want to remind everyone, based on a vote a week ago that the school committee took, uh, the April school vacation, which was originally scheduled for next week, has been modified. Uh, this coming Monday is Patriots Day. There'll be no school business or remote learning that happens on that state holiday. Um, April 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week are now remote learning days. Um, Shrewsbury Public School staff and students will be engaged with learning. Those days essentially count uh, towards the minimum 180-day requirement based on the guidance that the Commissioner of Education uh, issued. Um, and uh, beyond that, uh, Friday is maintained as a vacation day. Um, that will also be a day that school business and remote learning will not be conducted. Um, so it will be a three-day week next week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with remote learning days. Um, and we know that uh, a significant majority of the community responded to a survey that indicated that was uh, their preference was to continue some remote learning. Um, otherwise, uh, given that people are essentially homebound and uh, We've adjusted that schedule and appreciate the school committee making that vote last week. Um, with that, at this point, I just want to remind people that our website uh, has a, uh, a great deal of information. Uh, there is a page de dedicated to all of the public communications uh, that we've uh, shared relative to the COVID-19 school closure. Um, additionally, there was a page where all the information on our remote learning plan can also be found. Um, so if you're misplaced something, you're not sure where an email was, uh, you can always go to our website and check that. Um, additionally, if you have questions, you can send an email to the info at shrewsbury.k12.ma.us email address. Um, call our main number 508-841-8400 uh, between 8 and 430 um, and uh, leave a voicemail at uh, whichever department you're trying to reach and someone will get back to you. Um, and of course, see the information that's posted on our website. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Ms. Meg Belsito, who is our Assistant Superintendent for Student Services, to provide a brief update regarding how we're delivering student services during the school closure. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education provided further guidance for our department in ensuring all parents receive notification regarding remote supports, resources, instruction, and services that have already begun and will continue to be in place during the closure. Within the next week, this notification will be sent to families electronically in the form of an N1, which is a district proposal to act. Within this document, families will see how the district is proposing services for students. As a reminder for everyone, we are not able to provide IEPs as they are written. These modified supports are consistent with the requirement that FAPE, a free appropriate public education, be provided with reference to students' individual circumstances as well as the overall modification of all student work during this time without regard to disability. Also for students in grades kindergarten through grade eight, progress reports were sent electronically today with report cards. Please note the progress report is based on trimester two that ended on March 13th, 2020. Additionally, the Department of Education released a family resource toolbox late last week to support students with disabilities, which was shared with families and will be posted on our website. And there's a quick snapshot of um, one of our students from the high school. Um, if anybody knows on Twitter, SHS Unified is doing a wonderful job sharing the new learning that's happening while students are apart but united. The next slide. On this slide, you can see examples of supports and resources and the percentage of what has been recommended to date for students at Shrewsbury High School. Keep in mind, this was a snapshot of data from just yesterday and service plans are st still being developed for some students as we have over 200 students just at the high school requiring accommodations and or IEPs. All buildings are doing this work right now. Additionally, there are expectations of all liaisons for communications with families based on the guidance from the US DOE and the Massachusetts Department of Education. Regular ongoing check-ins with families by liaisons, recognizing that things will change over time and to be responsive to that while also discussing special education supports and services, prioritizing learning needs with the input from parents and other team members problem solving, learning and behavioral issues in the home, customizing a daily schedule in the home and helping to overcome individual obstacles. Also, all staff are required to document these discussions and decisions made as a result. Teachers have a log that they're filling out for each of the mentioned interactions. So that's just an example of some of the supports and resources 
Um, the picture you see at the top is actually not from a high school family. It's actually from an elementary school family. Some of the supports and resources that were sent along electronically, um, the parent has responded and has been sharing photos with how the child's doing at home. Next one. Here's another snapshot for the areas of instruction and services from Shrewsbury High School as of yesterday. Live online instructions and consultations with parents are the largest forms of instruction and services. Overall, special educators, including related service providers, are responsible right now for report card grades, progress reports, as I had mentioned, communicating individually with every family to be responsive to their needs. They're developing and sending out individual service plans for every student on an IEP, after having collaborated with all IEP service providers to get their input, plus collaborating with team teachers to provide input and recommendations for curriculum assignments and curriculum content for essential skills, intensive and ELC coordinators. Lastly, and just to reiterate, reiterate again, across the district team chairs and working with all teams will be issuing written notification to nearly 1000 families within a week, which as I'm sure Everyone can agree and imagine this requires a lot of work, effort, while balancing working remotely from home. As I keep reinforcing with staff this quote that was recently shared, you are not working from home, you are at home during a crisis trying to work. Be kind to yourself. And that's where we are with student services at this point in time. Thank you, Ms. Belsito. Uh, and at this time, I'd ask uh, Noelle Freeman, who's our Director of School Nursing, to provide an update relative to the work that she and her team are doing. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Um, at this point, in addition to working with our colleagues to reach students and families in a remote environment, the nursing focus has shifted to two main areas. Um, first, support for members of the school community who are dealing with illness, and also support for the greater community through collaboration with the Central Mass Regional Public Health Alliance. During this time, families are reaching out to trusted school staff regarding illnesses at home, whether it be COVID-related or other illness. And when this information is received, it is shared with the principal, the school nurse in the building, and myself. This process allows us to track the extent of illness in our school community, and most importantly, to offer support. After receiving the information, school nurses reach out to families to connect, offer support, and be sure that people are aware of available resources, as well as to re reassure the family and the student that there will be flexibility around expectations for student work completion as needed. <clears throat> With all that is going on, we recognize that the, these are stressful times for everyone and that an illness of any kind at this point can often add to that stress. Regardless of who is ill in the family, whether it's the student themselves, a parent or grandparent, et cetera, the ability to carry on at home can be affected. And we want our families to know that school will continue to be a support for families, albeit remotely. In addition to this support for our families, Similar support is available for our staff who are dealing with illness at home. As far as support for the greater community, it's not surprising that this pandemic has challenged our typical public health resources. To that end, my team of nurses is working with the Worcester Division of Public Health Central Massachusetts Re Regional Health Alliance to contact people who have tested positive for COVID-19. We provide information on isolation and quarantine procedures, determine close contacts, and gather epidemiologic data, which we then record in the state's online database. New cases are assigned to us daily by the Worcester Public Health nurse, and it is again not surprising that our Shrewsbury School nurses have risen to the challenge of adding this new skill set to our repertoire. This collaboration helps us to ensure that people who have been tested, who have tested positive for COVID-19 have the information that they need to prevent further spread, which is crucial in our efforts to flatten the curve. I do want to thank Patricia Bruckman, who's the chief public health nurse in Worcester. Her expertise and patience have made our transition to this work possible. Lastly, my contact information is included on the slide and I encourage people to reach out if assistance is needed. Thank you, uh, Ms. Freeman. Thank you to uh, the, the team of nurses uh, for our school district uh, for not only 
supporting our families at this time, but going above and beyond to work with our Central Mass Regional Public Health Alliance to do this tracking. Well, we know and we hear on the news how important it is um, to isolate and to track uh, as a way to uh, deal with the uh, pandemic and uh, appreciate that our nurses are, are contributing to that as well. At this point, uh, I'll ask Dr. Lazat uh, to share some information about things that are happening in terms of partnering with the community during this time, um, as well as promoting uh, the well being of our uh, students and staff and families. Thank you. Um, I am very grateful to the efforts of Kathleen Cohane and Michelle Biscotti, our coordinators of development and volunteer activities, for helping me um, get started with a um, the SHS student and alumni mentoring program that will begin uh, next week virtually through um, Zoom webinars. We have approximately 60 alumni who have offered to share their life experiences after high school. Those include um, work in careers and college, graduate school, et cetera. Um, we have grouped the alumni into teams of three and four people who are, um, again, ready, willing, and enthusiastic to share with students um, some of the learning um, in which they have been engaged and also to answer questions. Um, so I strongly recommend sophomores, juniors, and seniors to join in a webinar. You don't have to speak unless you are willing to do that, but just listen um, and, and learn. Really, it's a great opportunity, um, again, to learn from others um, in a way that's uh, exciting and um, you know, hopefully it will prove, I, I strongly believe it will to be beneficial to all who participate. So that starts next week um, and you can sign up through Schoology. Some emails have gone out from Mr. Bazillo and the SHS leadership team. So check your emails um, and I will be attending many of those uh, webinars as will Kathleen and Michelle. So we look forward um, to being present to all of you who are interested. We are also, um, students, families, and staff have been partnering with local agencies to provide physical, mental, and emotional support to those in our community and those in surrounding communities. I've uh, mentioned just a few in this slide. We have a team at Sherwood Middle School um, under the uh, direction of Erin Riscozzi, Kelly O'Connell, Sarah Matthews, Carol Rocco and Lisa Eason, um, who have organized a card drive that's been highlighted in the past few community bulletins. So please be sure to check out the details regarding the card drive. Um, we have several students who have created uh, beautiful and uplifting cards for um, those uh, medical workers, police, fire, um, those in our elder communities who are looking for some sunshine during this challenging time. So thank you. Um, this is a district-wide effort. And again, you can find more information in the community bulletin. We also have two sophomores at Shrewsbury High School who are engaged with um, Oak Middle School retired counselor Sue DeLeo in a food drive and there'll be information uh, being sent home to families and community members next week regarding the food drive. And also just several um, email communications and phone calls to me and my colleagues offering uh, people's time money, um, efforts, and energy, and we're just so appreciative um, to the dozens and dozens of you who have um, offered to help, and we will continue to uh, take you up on those offers in the coming weeks. I believe it was Mr. Collins who said this is a marathon, not a sprint, and we know that, and we're living it, um, and we are um, will continue again to enlist um, your efforts, and we thank you for those. Um, so our um, 
our community truly is coming together um, in so many different ways. And again, I've just highlighted a couple here um, and we look forward to sharing more in the coming weeks, both through the community bulletin, uh, through the updates, um, my own updates and those of my colleagues. So stay tuned. The next slide, please. In the area of well being of all, um, I would like to uh, just thank again um, the several people, staff, and parents who have suggested offerings um, for themselves and their children. We have a few mentioned on this slide as they represent support for staff, families, and students. Um, first, I'd like to thank Shrewsbury High School health teacher Erin Burtnick who has been teaching evening classes for the past couple of weeks to any interested shoes take place on Tuesday and Thursday evenings at 5.30 and they include high intensity kickboxing. We have 31 staff who are registered for um, those health classes. So thank you to Erin um, for that idea. It was a terrific one and it has been well received by many. Also on Monday afternoons, um, mindfulness and racial justice is being um, taught by Mark Waxman from the Mindfulness Director Initiative and uh, with the support of Mara Egan, ELA teacher at Oak Middle School. We have 20 staff involved in um, this course offering that focuses on the, the book, the work, the inner work of racial, racial justice. I was looking at some postings today from the group participants and several mention um, that it is a, uh, it's an uplifting time of their day on Monday afternoons when they are engaging in this way with one another and around such an important topics. Um, Mark is also facilitating free online mindfulness classes to staff and community members. Um, he has 45 participants currently. Uh, those take place on Wednesdays at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. and on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Jenny Maddox, also of the Mindfulness Director Initiative, is facilitating mindfulness sessions for Shrewsbury High School students. We had some technical difficulties yesterday, so they're going to be in full force um, again um, beginning tomorrow for students in grades 11 and 12 at 3 o'clock and on Tuesdays, um, including next week for students in grades 9 and 10. Um, so again, just some options along with a host of resources on our district website for families and uh, community members to access. So. Thank you to everyone who is actively engaging in this way. Okay, that's the end of the slide presentation. I wanna thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Ms. Belsito and Ms. Freeman and Dr. Lazat uh, for their uh, parts of the report. And again, thank you to everyone who is uh, finding a way to reach out and uh, connect and, and help support uh, our students and families uh, and each other among their colleagues. Um, during this difficult time. And with that, uh, next up, of course, will be um, Mrs. Clouder's uh, report on remote learning. But if there's other elements of uh, uh, the report we just gave relative to those updates that the school committee has any questions on, we'd be happy to answer those at this time. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Lindsay? I um, want to thank all of you. Uh, each each of these areas is so critically important. From I want to say the health of our of our community, um, the supports for our um, the students in our district who need individualized instruction and support, and then the uh, I, I want to get in, in on an exercise class, Jane, and we're all struggling with our, our keeping our emotional sanity uh, at this moment in time. So uh, thank you all for for your efforts. I just I do want to just acknowledge. Um, to you, Meg, your staffs need to, to get letters out to a thousand families is pretty Herculean uh, and, and in an individualized way. <laughs> uh, we're really thinking about it, so I really appreciate and just want to acknowledge how much effort that must be to try to figure out how, how on earth to do this work, uh, that you have the particular work that's done by our special educators and support personnel um, for, for, for our young people. I just, I know it's a huge stressor, but it's also really important, so I thank you for that. Um, I did just have one question for you, um, Dr. Lazat. 
the classes that are being offered on mindfulness for the high school students is, I know you've talked to us before about series of classes, is, but is that sort of a one-time class or are we hoping to get cohorts or what, what's the thinking a little bit there? <laughs> it's an ongoing drop-in class. So you can go on one Tuesday or several and they'll be offered for as long as we are learning remotely um, and being together in this way. So you don't, you can just attend. Um, Todd Bazillo will be sending out instructions again on how to join that, our Zoom mindfulness sessions. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Seeing none. Just Joelle, I have a question for you on, you talked about um, st stress with families and students and that you have support for them. Can you talk a little bit about what supports are being provided? Um, so just making sure that um, families are aware to, you know, if, if food is a stressor, certainly to, you know, make sure that they're aware of the food um, distribution program that we have going. Um, also to connect them with school counselors, school psychologists, if they, you know, may not have had a need for that in the past, they may not um, have made that connection in the past. Um, and then, you know, certainly looking to refer people to outside services, um, shoes for youth and family, things like that, if um, they need another level of care. Excellent, thank you. Sandy, Someone just else uh, a question? John, yeah. yeah, just a quick comment. Uh, appreciate all the effort that's being put into keeping the district afloat virtually. Uh, I think it's very deep uh, in terms of what you presented. Also appreciate you know the additional um, uh, activities that are available that are outside of the day to day you know, almost like the virtual extracurricular activities that you're providing. I think that's really important. We always talk about the importance of extracurricular um, in addition to what kids are doing in the classroom. So appreciate the alternatives that are being offered uh, outside of the uh, normal classwork. So that's great. Great. And I, I failed to mention just to maybe whet some appetites of our students, but um, just a few examples of the alumni who um, are engaging with our students beginning next week. We have a film major who now works for NBC Sports in Washington, DC, a venture capitalist and entrepreneur in California who runs a company that invests in new startups, mm -hmm. two alumni majoring in computer science, one an undergrad and the other a PhD candidate, each of whom have interned with companies including Northrop Grumman, Google and Amazon Labs. Uh, two alumni who are engineers, one working for a medical diagnostics startup in Oregon, and another who is working on designing a flying car. A retired Army colonel who attended college on a ROTC scholarship. Two alumni who are attorneys, one focused on env environmental law and the other an assistant attorney general in Colorado. Four alumni seeking to share their insights and advice regarding transitioning from high school to the workplace and or college. Um, one grad who's currently in the Peace Corps and other alumni participants who are currently working in finance, marketing, education and real estate. Um, we have one participant who's not an alumni but a good friend of ours, Lisa Raby from the Shrewsbury Federal Credit Union. Mm -hmm. um, she will be also engaging with our students. So again, some um, a great opportunity um, for our students to participate. And as I say, even just to listen to the stories told by the alumni who have a great deal of life experiences to share, including the important lessons learned along the way. So that's it. Excellent, thank you everyone for your presentation. Okay, next on the agenda will be an update from Ms. Clowder, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, and she will provide an update on the Shrewsbury Public Schools remote learning. Thank you very much. I'm always excited to talk about teaching and learning, and it's nice to be able to spend some extended time talking about remote learning because it's so new for all of us. In my previous communications, I've made a point of thanking our educators who've been foremost on my mind as both teachers and learners. I've also thanked families because the situation has pressed them into service as teachers in new ways. 
And for that reason, the messages of support that parents included in the survey about April vacation were particularly gratifying, especially knowing as I do that we still have many challenges before us. Um, both educators and families continue to work really hard to remain not just connected, but engaged. And I feel really fortunate to work in a district where we're united in our desire to do so well by our children. Before I go further though, I wanna thank you as committee members too. You play many roles and in times of crisis, the role of champion is one I'm really grateful for, but I know well that your job is bigger than that. And I value your more critical feedback because I understand that it comes from a hopeful place. Feedback is motivating, and while most of our work has been affirmed by parent feedback, not all of our aspirations have been realized yet. We'll continue to work to deliver the very best learning experiences that we can, and I know that I'll have your ongoing support, and our educators will too. Um, the goal of this presentation is really just to preview in a more detailed way how the district has responded to the pandemic, and of course, to give the committee the chance to ask questions about the report I shared with you earlier, or really anything that's on your mind as we move forward with the next phase of remote learning. As you know, we took our cues on how to respond to the COVID crisis from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in partnership with local stakeholders like yourselves, district leaders, and the Shrewsbury Education Association. Our approach was also informed by the actions of area districts, and we did some deep collaboration with local partners um, and our DART districts as we were thinking about what our next moves would be. I wanted to just give you an overview of the timeline in terms of the different phases of remote learning that we've been in, starting with just connecting and building community, and then moving into assigning tasks, monitoring and supporting our students. And now we're entering a new phase, well, we, we have entered a new phase of remote and robust learning. Um, and I think it's helpful to look at the specifics of the timeline because it, um, it feels, <laughs> frankly, like St. Patrick's Day was a year ago. Um, and I know that uh, many of you home with children are feeling like a month is a really long time. But on the planning end of it, um, I think looking at the snapshot in small bites, thinking of those three phases helps people to kind of understand the iterative nature of, of the plan and how it's developed the, the way it has. So I just wanna walk people through kind of the, the first phase being our desire to kind of connect and build community in a new environment. Um, on March 12th, Dr. Sawyer decided to close school um, due to further developments related to the coronavirus situation. And on March 13th, he decided to close the district schools for the following week out of an abundance of caution. At that point, we didn't have direction from the state um, that was definitive. And uh, it bought us some time to do some additional planning. Work began right away on resources for students and families opting into learning experiences at home. And because March 13th and March 16th were treated like snow days in order to add those days to the end of the school calendar in June, they weren't work days for Shrewsbury educators. They weren't work days for administrators and it bought us some really powerful time for planning with the leadership team. And so for that reason, we were able to pivot relatively well um, when we had new additional news. So with the likelihood that a longer period of school closure was imminent, we began discussions about how to support families during school disruption. On March 16th, which is day two, um, we released the learning opportunity resources, communicating our initial opt-in approach to learning experiences in accordance with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education guidelines. And we began outreach to families. On their own, of course, our educators across the district reached out to connect with students in a variety of ways and using different formats with, formats with a focus on health and well-being, and just reaching out to make sure everybody was okay. Um, significantly, the district also began to organize food delivery for families, and that started on March 17th, which was only day three of the closure, and give uh, Pat Collins and the food service department team a lot of credit for organizing that quickly. And then we started moving into the second phase um, of this remote learning environment. With the release of the U.S. Department of Education supplemental guidance on Saturday, March 21st, it seemed to signal a shift from the advice we received the prior week. Specifically, the Department of Education was saying that ensuring compliance with individuals with disabilities 
Education Act, what we know as IDEA, shouldn't, school, shouldn't prevent schools from offering instruction on distance learning. And so the following Monday, which is March 23rd, the leadership team started talking about the implications for planning, including how we might support students and families with really diverse needs. Um, because it was clear at that point that we were looking at a longer period of extended closure and we'd have to work really hard to bridge the gap, both for families with students with special needs, but also families whose first language was not English. With the announcement of extended closure on the 25th and new guidance from DESE on March 26th, affirming the importance of assigned work and outreach, the district shifted the approach to prepare for a new phase of remote learning, including planning for how we could support technology needs. And our efforts at this point um, centered on how to get iPads and internet access to families who needed technology. And I credit Brian LaRue, who I know is listening and never gets enough credit for all the work that he's juggling and his incredible staff for scrambling to do a couple of things at once, namely looking at all of the different platforms our staff were using to communicate with families to make sure that they were respectful of confidentiality and student privacy, supporting the device initiative and also exploring future platforms uh, in terms of long-term suitability. On the same day, March 26th, that we received guidance <clears throat> from the DESC, the district issued goals and guiding principles for remote learning. Based on the guidelines from the Department of Ed, the next day we launched the next phase of remote learning, which included a focus on assigned work, recommending learning goals by level, um, collecting student work that had been assigned and providing students feedback on the work that they'd done. And that really set the stage for raising it up yet another level by thinking about how we could leverage the time bought in planning and Brian's good work thinking about potential platforms going forward for interaction to think about more robust learning. So on March 30th, the Commissioner of Education, Jeff Riley, issued a letter to families informing them about the shift to remote learning, signaling new expectations for assignments and outreach, as well as ongoing concerns about equity and access. And the district was well positioned to work through additional dimensions, including privacy and legal issues related to video conferencing. And at all levels, we started thinking about the implications of the pandemic on our staff and how we might organize our planning teacher teams so that we would provide consistency, both across grade levels and schools, but also redundancy in case the pandemic started to, God forbid, affect our teaching staff. Um, we didn't want the quality of what we were putting out to be affected on the student end. Um, and we worked hard to mitigate that to the greatest extent possible. On April 6th, the department released a document entitled Supporting Students with Disabilities for All Educators. And that um, really was the attention was to safeguard student confidentiality, student privacy and clarify accessibility standards. And on that same day, the district released a formal memo to staff and families expanding the plan for remote learning, including live interactions with students, virtual office hours and a plan to teach new content beginning on April 8th and 9th. That same week, Dr. Sawyer surveyed staff and families regarding April vacation and as you know, uh, you voted to make um, the 21st through the 23rd remote learning days. A crisis tests an organization in a lot of ways. Um, and although I think we're focusing on what we have yet informed uh, before us, I really wanna make sure we celebrate some of the early successes. Um, we really were thinking first and foremost about health and safety and uh, our remote learning options were designed specifically to help people see lots of different possibilities for engaging their students based on their interest, um, based on what they had available. Uh, so we focused on both pen and pencil resources as well as online resources. We looked at enrichment opportunities in terms of visiting remote museums, as well as um, really good practice opportunities for kids that were building fluency. As I mentioned, the food services department organized to start del meal delivery right away. And our educators started collaborating right away, thinking about what are the best ways to connect with their students and families. Um, and so because each 
department really was focused on doing the very best they could with what they had, um, we were able to connect with a good portion of our families and start getting feedback from them about what was helpful and what was not so helpful. And so people really appreciated the focus on health and safety. They were looking for more information about academic skills and guidance about which skills were most important. And they were also really eager to tell us that because of the scramble that educators had in terms of connecting, we were overloading people with emails and Zooming. Um, and there was a little bit too much in terms of our attempts to connect. And it was gonna be helpful to have some predictability in the scheduling uh, and some flexibility built in for parents who were simultaneously teaching and guiding their students, but also trying to balance their own telecommuting needs. So some of the lessons that we learned were, we offered a lot of resources, but parents needed some help navigating them. Um, our students are more motivated by assigned work. So when we made work optional, uh, some of our students interpret that that is that I, they didn't have to do it. Um, we also learned that children are more likely to persevere when we match the task to the need. So we had to think about what was most important to focus on. Um, and we had to make sure that students received feedback on their work because um, some of the interactions that we took for granted in a face-to-face -face environment um, were hard to replicate online, but the feedback itself was really important. So with a new environment, we've had some new needs and you've heard me speak in past presentations about the iterative nature of the design process um, improvements really hinge on user feedback, and we were fortunate to get feedback from teacher users, parent users, in some cases our student users, you see our really youngest students all zooming there. Um, and in the first 10 days it was clear that we could make some small changes that would have a really big impact. There were some also changes that we knew we couldn't make that quickly, and um, in terms of scaling up to protect student privacy, uh, some of the things that we could do had budget implications, which meant we had to kind of think through that. Other things that we could do meant redefining roles and responsibilities, uh, which meant having to network across departments to think about what would be the role of a paraprofessional in a remote environment and how would we support that work. And finally, the crisis made plain some of the things that we had deferred as investments as nice to haves, especially in the area of elementary technology. We use Schoology as a platform at the middle and the high school level and in a one-to-one -one environment. Students understand very well how to use that platform. At the elementary level, when students don't have their own device and they hadn't used that platform, the gap between home and school was that much bigger. And Schoology um, is not a kind of platform that's intuitive or easy to use overnight. And it was pretty clear that although that was the district platform and will remain the district platform in many ways, it wasn't good for submitting student work. So once we added the, um, the more robust aspects of feedback, we needed a more user-friendly way for families and students to be able to share their work back with us. And so we finally identified Seesaw as being a, a example of a platform that was in use that we can leverage better. Um, and it's fairly user-friendly. Some of our biggest users are at the preschool level. So I think that's a good harbinger of our future success. Um, and then of course, having put that into place, we have to anticipate it's not gonna be intuitive for some people. So we have to think about how do we have some parent-friendly PD and how do we move staff that maybe weren't using that tool into a better place? It's clear that families really preferred direction over options, streamlined communication, predictabilities that schedules would prevent, uh, present and robust assignments so that we had to kind of identify if we're thinking about the guidance from the Department of Ed Education saying that we should be targeting around 50% of what we would otherwise cover if we're going to school, how do we identify what the most important standards are? And then how do we kind of translate that into plans every week. And then we had to think a little bit about maintaining what was most positive about those first 10 days, which was connecting. So how do you balance the social emotional aspect of learning with some of the academic skills that we were pushing out? 
because we really, uh, I think Dr. Sawyer described it best. We had a Goldilocks situation with some parents saying, this isn't enough. And some parents saying, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. I just got caught up with what you had pushed out before. Um, and so going forward, we've really tried to keep a, a balance between flexibility and responsiveness. Um, and also thinking about what's best practice in a remote environment, because none of us anticipated the degree to which we would be working remotely. So in terms of planning with best practice, uh, I think this infographic from the Highlander Institute kind of shows the, um, the advice that is in the field around where do you focus first? And um, because families are going to be kind of the arbiters of teaching and learning, making those connections with families around safety and well being first is important. So it, it has that really bigger space at the bottom of the pyramid. And then ongoing communication with families and then students come next because those are the things that help us understand how we're going to support the learners in a new environment. And then finally, the kind of the cornerstone, the last piece is getting to meaningful learning. And I think what this suggests is that you can't get to meaningful learning until you go through those stages of making connections around safety and well being. And I think it's a helpful reminder. I know it was gratifying to me to see it because it, it gave, um, credence to the fact that where we began with families and also a helpful push to say, we can't remain there at that lower level, especially with the potential of extended closure. We wanna quickly think about how we can leverage our experiences to be more meaningful in terms of teaching and learning. One question that I've heard um, is that, you know, so is it, is it all the live interactions, are they mandatory? And We've stayed away with, uh, in terms of communicating with families from using words like mandatory or required because we purposely wanted to keep the temperature low for families who are themselves struggling with the virus or loved ones who have it, um, or simply struggling with balancing work-life schedules and te telecommuting from home. But I think what I want to like families to feel permission to say to students is we do expect that uh, students will show up for those live interactions. Um, so if they are available and if they are free, it is an expectation that students will participate. And um, I'm, I'm hopeful that that will result in more students making the transition from optional to expected. So what is remote learning? Remote learning is not intended to replicate school. And I think we all have to have a moment just to mourn the loss of that. Because I think for some of our educators, the source of stress that they're feeling is that they haven't given up the attempt. And the source of stress for parents is they're trying to make up for the loss. And it's not possible to do that. The good news is when we think about what is possible, we've learned quite a lot is possible. Our educators are innovators. Our educators are more innovative than most and frankly, it was hard to select just a few examples from all of the things I reviewed for this presentation tonight. Um, I wanna show you some examples of what is happening despite the difficulties, because I think it really showcases the best of us. Um, I know that there are many more examples out there than I have time to show you tonight. And I'm hoping um, as principals publish the links that not only will families be able to explore the options available to their students at a particular grade, but they'll be able to explore kind of what's happening in some other grades because a student who is really, you know, fluent as a reader may want to read beyond their grade level and explore what's happening in, in other grade levels. And somebody who's particularly interested in science might want to click around and see some new learning. Um, and I think this is a nice opportunity for kids to do that. So when we think about remote learning, we're not just talking about online learning. Um, we're talking about a combination of kind of traditional tasks as well as um, engaging online in a, in a video conferencing format um, or through a you know, posted discussion board uh, or by sending a product that's been created by students with devices or without back via technology to the teacher. Um, so I think it's important to say we're not trying to uh, set up students for online learning either. It's really a blended learning environment uh, where we're trying to replicate the best of engagement um, while targeting the most important standards.
And um, in our conference call with the commissioner earlier this week, um, one of the things we heard was from an article written by Justin Reich. And um, he's an assistant professor at MIT and the director of the Teaching Systems Lab. And he's somebody who uh, has worked with our leadership team and also with EdTech Teacher, which is one of the PD providers that we really favor when we're talking about how we use technology to advance teaching and learning. And in an article that he'd written in ASCD, he talks about the importance of schools keeping it simple. And he looked at the criteria for remote learning kind of based on what's happening nationally. And I think it doesn't surprise me, but it pleases me to see Massachusetts placing so highly in terms of our response. Um, I do have relatives in other states. And when this hit, I went on to see what was happening in county systems because they can leverage things much bigger because they're bigger systems. And one of the things that I noticed was uh, the dilemma between fast and easy, that we could put something online that would essentially replicate low level practice for kids. It might have bells and whistles or exploding asteroids, but essentially it would be like having kids complete worksheet after worksheet. And we knew that that's not what we wanted. There is definitely a place for practice and you'll see in our resources an emphasis on practice, that's important. But that's not what we all, all that we aspired to be. And I think um, you'll see in the, the plans that I feature tonight, some of the creativity that our educators have brought to thinking about how to hold on to what's the best of teaching and learning when we're all together in school. Uh, and this study kind of reaffirms that the approach that Massachusetts is taking to balance those two things is, is working. The questions that the study asks is, <clears throat> you know, you have to think about three questions. You know, what is it that you're doing to help connect with families? Um, what is it that you're doing to think about um, focusing on the most important tasks? And then how are you going to use technology but not get overly focused on it um, as your vehicle for getting there? In other words, try not to do complicated technology at the same time that you're grappling with complexity in the learning situation. Uh, and so where technology makes sense, it's appropriate, but it's important, he says, not to focus on um, technology as the solution, but really as thinking about what are parents and, and students telling us about the, the things that we're already doing that make for worthwhile connection. So I wanted to show a little bit about this and I'm starting with a very simple example. Um, this is a Math and Focus worksheet. Math and Focus is our elementary math program. And we have an online version of the student workbook and part of the daily plan for grade two for this particular week was practicing um, looking at you know, the, the concepts of measurement with a very traditional worksheet. Uh, it wasn't the only thing that was pushed out as a learning task. Um, but I think sometimes you are going to see something that looks more traditional pen and pa paper. Um, on the other hand, you're going to see some things that are really remarkable. Um, other leverage, uh, other assignments kind of leverage technology to more closely replicate a classroom experience. And one of the nice features of remote learning is that what's been created by one teacher can easily be shared with all. Uh, it, What's also nice about it is that when things are asynchronous, it means that it makes for easier access. People can watch a video as many times as they want, or they can share a video and watch it at any point. Um, it's convenient to families that way, and it's helpful to students that way who might need some assistance accessing the video. Um, and so this um, slide I'm about to show you, well, and with Dr. Sawyer's help play, um, features Kara Frankian, who is a first grade teacher and a key player in environmental science and making us aware of the nature trails in Shrewsbury, particularly linking outdoor education to science education. She's a science pilot teacher. And um, rather than just teaching her class, she's essentially featured on one of the grade one slides teaching all first graders. So our students have been able to access more than their own teacher as a result of the remote learning platform in ways that were, weren't possible before. So this took more organization because at the elementary level, we have content teams 
made up of educators across all of our schools. Um, and they've devoted extra time to this planning effort. But the results are really amazing and I think they speak for themselves. So Dr. Sori, would you please click the video? Hi scientists. So today we're gonna to follow up on the work that you did yesterday, thinking about your senses and your body parts. I have something in this bag and I'm gonna move it a little closer to you so you can kind of listen. Can you hear it? What could be in here? I'd like you to take a couple minutes and just brainstorm some ideas what could be in this bag. And I'll be back in a minute. And then later in the same week, or the following week, sorry. So morning first grade scientists, it's Mrs. Frankie in again. And last week on your learning, I had asked you to take a look at um, mealworms. So this is one of them. And this is, I don't know, with the light, um, you can see it's using its legs to walk. One of the things that I noticed last week, when it walks backwards, it actually is contracting these sections to help it do some moving too. Um, so that, that was an interesting observation that I made last week. And on the... So I've asked Dr. Sawyer to stop the video in the interest of time, but I bet you wanna see the rest of it. And I would bet that our students do too. Um, and that's linked to a series of lessons around scientific drawing that are again more pencil and paper but you know I hats off to Mrs. Frankie and for making mealworms exciting uh, especially in a remote learning environment. So the other thing about remote learning is that it's made it possible for teachers that don't typically have time together to share their work and expertise. So I chose this example that's included in the grade four slide deck because it features some of the terrific work from our K-12 departments. And you can see art, PE, music, and media represented here, each of whom have an activity that's linked to some of the learning that was happening in the trimesters that kids were meeting with their specials. Um, and I emphasize it because I think when we talk about remote learning, we wanna emphasize to kids that we're also talking about continuing to get exercise and attend to their health um, reading things for pleasure and being mindful about their reading choices as they would in media, um, thinking about how to represent their thinking in artistic and creative ways, and also sharing their work with others. And one of the things that's really lovely is watching how the music department has been able to kind of foster the practice that they've been doing with students by having kids upload brief videos. And um, I wanna take the opportunity to say that the art department is also really interested in seeing what our kids are creating and having kids submit their work so that they can put together collages to then feed back to the community. So we've talked about as we move closer to integrating technology into meaningful teaching and learning, how we can make students aware of the wider audience beyond their classroom and one of the benefits of remote learning has been in a very real way to present that audience in a safe way. It's now just their classmates and, and potentially the district. Um, but I think it could be as wide as the Shrewsbury community in the near future, because you'll see some of these things already going out on Twitter and getting lots of feedback and interest. And so I think our community is, is getting a window into the classroom in ways that were not as easy to access before. So moving forward, this is a grade eight example um, from the green team. And uh, this is a, a social studies as, uh, assignment that prompts students to start thinking about the concept before formal teaching begins, which is a little bit like the flipped classroom approach that you've heard about. Um, this is an infographic about the Renaissance and it asks them to think about the metaphors represented in the image and think a little bit about what each piece represents. And then they'll have time to kind of hear a little bit more about that on the slide deck and then submit their own thinking on a discussion board. So again, 
some of the same teaching tasks that you'd see in the classroom, but delivered in a new way. This is one of my favorites. This is um, Spanish teacher Evan Sui who put together a video. Um, his goal is really to build students oral proficiency. And one of the nice aspects of remote learning is it is a really authentic way for kids to practice speaking and learning. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to have Dr. Sawyer play this video, but then on the right, you can see he's asked students to create a companion video and submit it back. And he has a whole gallery of these student videos. Without permission, I don't want to share the student videos, but I have to tell you, they're just as well done as the production in um, Senor Sui. So let's watch that. Lo que me gusta de Señor Su. <risa> Buenos días. Son las 8 de la mañana y hace buen tiempo hoy. En la mañana me gusta tomar café. Mm, es delicioso. Son las 10 de la mañana. Me gusta leer un libro. Hay muchos fotos. Cuando hay coronavirus y hace sol, me gusta practicar deportes. ¿Qué te gusta hacer? So again, he challenges his students to talk about what they like doing and to send that back. And then in addition to seeing the model that he has for oral proficiency and how to apply the Spanish skills they've learned, they now have their own classmates responses. And also they get to apply some of the skills that they've learned, not in Spanish, but in general, in terms of using technology to put together a meaningful presentation. I think that's just a really great example of how we can make the best of remote learning. I wanted to showcase some examples at the high school as well, because you can see um, with online assignments in Schoology, the capability that teachers have at this level to include a variety of sources, including their own work products, and, and, and to support students in revisiting both top concepts and, and learning new skills. The piece that I think is also particularly impressive, but it's in small print, is uh, instead where it says teacher, it says the biology teachers, um, periods, all of them. Uh, and I think that that really uh, highlights some of the collaboration that's resulted from having a remote learning environment because at the high school, our teachers don't have that built-in collaboration time during the day. And it, I think that speaks to how much they've, they've really treasured it. So they found opportunity in crisis and I applaud them for that. And again, I don't know if you remember, but I, I certainly do standing in front of the class for current events and having to pick out an article from the media to share and uh, deliver why I thought it was important and how it impacted our daily lives. Um, our history department at the high school is looking at the current events to think more broadly about the implications of the history that's being made now on society and culture and equity. And again, rather than finding one article, they're encouraging kids to really get a variety of perspectives in real time about the crisis and to think through how it will be impactful to them. And I can't think of a better way to kind of engage kids at that level in something that will undoubtedly stick with them for the remainder of their lives, but also really impact them in terms of citizens. The other thing, of course, is that in some ways, remote learning lays bare just how motivated or self-directed our students are when traditional feedback systems are disrupted. And there's a famous study conducted uh, looking at the problem-solving skills of Japanese students at the elementary level compared to students at the United States, and they were given an impossible math problem to solve. And American students gave up in minutes, and Japanese students had to be forced to stop. Um, I don't think that 
you know, that's because Japanese students are any more capable math wise. But I think the level of perseverance that's expected um, makes a difference. Uh, and I think one of the things that we've really seen as a result of the crisis is that our students are reliant both on their families at home and their teachers for affirmation and for you know feedback that makes them continue. And teachers were really surprised and alarmed by the number of kids who, when school was optional, didn't engage. And so I think that's just um, food for thought as a community to think a little bit about the portrait of the graduate, which is really asking kids to be resilient and critical thinkers and collaborators amongst themselves. How do we develop that better? Um, and I put the Greg Tang level seven um, challenge up there because that's one of the resources that we highlighted as our optional resource. And I wanna bless those resources, even though they're optional, it doesn't mean that there's something you can't leverage. So for families at the other end who are finding their kids are super engaged and looking for more things, um, because again, we have the whole spectrum um, there are some really good resources, particularly on his level, that ask kids to apply their number sense in ways that are really engaging, both in terms of having a game board and a real-time challenge to submit your work to a larger math community, but also that get at practice beyond rote. Um, and I think um, if people haven't taken a look at those, um, there are some really nice things in there and uh, some websites that are just as we're talking about and putting out plans also putting on periodic ways to engage families. Um, so for those of you who are feeling like it hasn't been enough, um, there are some really great resources there that uh, I'm sure can be continuously tapped. So when we think about change, we can anticipate that we're going to see a little dip in implementation <clears throat> as we start to grapple with the change situation. Um, Barriers that are pretty common to any change situation include time. And we've talked already about how the timeline of what we knew and when we knew it affected our planning. But another barrier is just understanding. And I think families have really grappled with kind of understanding what is expected and teachers have grappled with understanding what the barriers for families really are. Um, resources is another predictable barrier. And I think we are in, well, good position now having identified which resources we're going to focus on supporting. Um, and that means that then we can think about how do we identify teacher leaders and how do we empower all people what, by providing professional development. And so I've begun to think in new ways that are a little bit more expansive than what I traditionally think of with professional development beyond our teachers thinking, how can we give parents access to some of the modules we're creating for teachers so that if they wanna learn more about some of the platforms, they can elect to do that too. So the way up and out of an implementation dip is through learning the new practices, there's, there's no shortcut for that. And just as we've all had to get used to looking at ourselves through Zoom in order to hold a meeting, our teachers have had to do that learning too. Um, we've all had to learn when to mute and when to unmute. <laughs> and, and our teachers have had to do that too. I think some of our teachers are wishing our students would practice that a little bit more often sometimes with the chaos in the background. Um, but I think most of all, we've really enjoyed connecting and then iterating and learning from that and then learning again about how to make it better and having invested in some common resources. I feel like we're in a good place that's more stable. We're not going to reissue another plan. We're gonna work the plan that we have and we're gonna add resources to it. Um, We've clearly affirmed our expectations for staff around having live interactions, not just about office hours, but about teaching and learning, and we'll continue to do that. But I wanted to remind everybody that as Shrewsbury is working on this, really the nation is working on this. Um, and I would put our teachers up against any teachers anywhere. I, I think that they've worked extraordinarily hard, even when challenged, to think about how to persevere. And the way I know that is when I started to focus on professional development, there were a number of people that I knew were Seesaw ambassadors, or I knew had a certain skill in screencasting. There were easily dozens more people who were referred to me because they were already helping their colleagues. 
not because that they known it before the closure, but because they felt that they needed to know it now. And then they just brought their team up to speed. And I'm so impressed by that. I, I think it's really important to think a little bit about um, reminding all of ourselves that, as Meg said, we are we are <laughs> in a crisis and trying to do work from home. So these are some phases uh, in terms of school responses. This comes from Scott McLeod, who is a, a blogger and a professor in his own right about education and technology. And I think the dilemma is thinking, you know, when are we going to get to the deeper learning and looking ahead? And I think it's important to remind ourselves that right now we are in all three places. Um, this morning, uh, Brian LaRue, our Director of Information Technology, sent an email to principals um, saying he'd once again held um, open hours to kind of get devices to families and a good proportion of families didn't show. And so I think for those families, we're still at phase one of basic access barriers. Um, for other families, we're thinking about subsistence learning, you know, that rapid teacher training, and we're gearing up to help people understand better how to do things they've not known how to do before. But we do have teachers that are already at deeper lean learning and, and they're not waiting for me. And I think that's a good thing. Um, those people can help leverage the people who are following behind them. And the goal I think is that we're all going to move up a step with time um, and keep every teacher engaged in trying to do the best they can where they're at. So this, for example, um, is a video, is a snapshot, not a video that I got from a teacher, Arlena Boyle at Parker Road. And in it, she's explaining what the features of Seesaw are and how it looks on the teacher end and how it looks on the student end out of an effort, I think, not to help her colleagues because they're all pretty familiar with Seesaw, but how to help parents see what students will be doing. And again, I think um, people like Arlena, people like Erin Kendrick, who's a Coolidge, um, instructional coast and, and curriculum coordinator. Um, people like Lynn Doherty, Kelly Finneran, Shauna Powers um, are thinking about how we structure learning both so that people can see and gather in virtual learning communities to talk about questions in real time, but also how we record those discussions so that people can watch them when it's convenient for them. And in recognizing that when we say to teachers, we're also concerned about their health and well being, that we consider that in the way we design professional development. So, in a sense, I think this slide shows we're trying to, if you think about remote learning as the elephant, we're trying to make friends with the elephant. Uh, and we're at the crossroads between technology and pedagogy. How do we leverage new tools to hold on to the things we most hold dear in teaching and learning? And how do we make friends with this new opportunity? Um, is remote learning perfect? No. It, frankly, it's taken a lot of effort on everyone's part to get where we've got to so far. Um, and sometimes I worry at too high a cost. Um, but at the same time, our efforts have gone to all the right places. And if we think about it, remote learning is it's not classroom learning. It's understandable that we're mourning the loss. Some of the positive changes we've seen as we've grappled with this opportunity is teachers using a consistent framework uh, called the Universal Design for Learning to kind of identify the barriers that students and, and families might be facing and to plan proactively for that. We've seen more focus on consistency than autonomy. Um, and at the same time, we've seen some barriers remaining, like how do we translate the things that we're creating um, or make them translatable to families? How do we continue to address some of the inequities around um, connecting internet speeds and devices? And how do we get more of the learning to be higher up in terms of what it's asking of kids cognitively? There are some things that are really important that we can't change. I, I wish we could call school back next week and we can't do that. Um, but we can think about the things that we do control um, we can think about how we can make the most of the virtual spaces that we've created so that we can leverage the smarts that we have. Um, and I think 
we can adapt. Um, so we've been able to shrink the change that teachers are facing with a team approach. Um, we've been able to start from where we are and then think about what's been most successful and then do more of that. Um, and we've been able to kind of connect departments in ways that we hadn't been able to do that before. So there are three quotes on my wall that I've been looking a lot at lately, and I'm reminded of two of them. There's Teddy Roosevelt, who knew a thing, few things about getting through the wilderness, who said, do what you can with what you have where you are. And then Maya Angelou, who said, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. Uh, and those things I think are resonating, not just for me, but for our educators. Our teachers are doing the best they can with what they have right now. We're, have, uh, we're looking for healthy stress. We want continuous improvement, but we certainly don't want anybody to feel burnt out or unappreciated. Um, and I think the suggestions for improvement that we received really resonate with me. You know, when I look at the survey feedback from parents, there are some things that we can make work next week. Um, but it's day 25, and while we're, we're proud of what we've accomplished in a relatively short time, um, we're not content to rest on our laurels. And although we have people doing all sorts of things that they've never done before in service of families, um, we'll continue to do that because I think the priority that we have is really supporting our students and families where they are as well. Typically, if we're thinking about a change, we anticipate the change and we put the professional development before the change. And now we're in a model where the opposite is true. Um, and it doesn't surprise me that we have hunger for new learning on the family side. I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware that we have hunger for new learning on the teacher side. And we have to be thoughtful about how to balance both of those interests. So that was a lot of talking on my end <laughs> in this new environment. I can't read everybody's faces at once. So I wanted to make sure we paused and had time for questions. Great, thank you so much, Amy. That was a great report. Questions and comments from the committee, Dale. Uh, this was a great report and I'm uh, grateful for all the good that you're doing. Um, in the materials we were given and in a part of your report, you made mention of the fact that there seem to be a significant number of families particularly at the elementary level that don't seem to have engaged in this. Uh, do you know more? Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, who this might be and how you're gonna approach it? I can tell you a little bit more. Some of the things we've learned, um, we've learned by activating networks where we're more likely to see those families connect. So for second language learning families, for example, you know, we're a district where only 3% of our students overall are English learners. 36% of our families speak a primary language other than English. So some of the very well-intentioned um, direction heavy slides that went out to help support people felt really overwhelming. Sometimes they were in formats that weren't translatable. And so having seen that kind of families withdrew, uh, the good news I think is that our uh, English language Education Director Kathleen Langbadden has reached out to connect with families and to learn more about how we can make things more accessible. Sometimes families have gone to visit other families um, before the crisis hit. Uh, sometimes it's a device or an internet issue. Sometimes it's a shared device issue. And so again, Brian's done incredible work with his team to try to think about how to solve the technology pieces. But at every school, there's a shared list. And this is another piece of the learning that I think is important where there's a protocol for who haven't we heard from? Who's the best point of contact? How do we reach out and massage that list? If it's illness, it's the nurses. If it's social emotional concerns, it's the adjustment counselors or the school psychologists. It's the principal massaging that list to see, okay, well, are people more likely to kind of tell me what's going on? Um, and I think classroom teachers are trying to think about how do they pace communication so they're not overwhelmed by all of those people but that they get a consistent reach outreach from at least one person um, at least you know three times a week. So it sounds like you're tracking this. Yes. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Lindsay. 
So I, I really appreciate the, the rep, all of the information uh, and the reference to thinking about this as a change management process. And ordinarily, we think about that in terms of sort of school settings about educators and educators changing. And so much of this and the uh, challenge here is that it's about educators and parents collaboratively changing together. Um, and so and that's that is, that is unique. And I think in many ways, that change is harder for adults than it is for youth. Um, the children in my house are pretty used to now knowing that they wake up and there's a tape schedule on the wall and we put time into that and they go and look at it and start doing their thing. Um, but, um, but that was stressful in my house for me as the adult to get to that place <laughs> uh, yeah. and to figure out what that was gonna look like and who was gonna make the schedule and how we were gonna fight about how to do that. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and so um, I really appreciate your thinking about um, building upon the bright spots, right? We know in a lot of research literature, we can build upon those and the places where you have teachers who are eager to try new things um, and to and to use that to motivate others and to say this this really is possible. One of the one of the pieces that has been most impressive to me, I had a, a, a nice call last week with um, Principal Wendy Bell, who I'm certainly sad that we're we're, we're losing, but has been a, a great leader for our district. And she reached out to ask about some of my, my thoughts about uh, being a being a, a two two parent at home, working from home with three kids at different grade levels. But it's not if I, I've shared with this group. It's there there are challenges. Um, and uh, and when she talked about the collaboration of not only across uh, elementary school buildings, which in and of itself was good, and we were doing some good work, but then across all of the buildings and all of the district, right? To think about how we how we create a rubric for time that uh, acknowledges when are kindergartners on technology and when are high schoolers on technology that is a that is a big lift and really impressive and hopefully we'll continue to grow um ways to collaborate in the in in the future once we're past this this crisis that so those relationships will, will keep building up um i will say as a as a parent some of the things the mealworm video like we watched that multiple times in my house uh and for those of you who want to know some scary things happen to that mealworm we do uh, and so I pre and but that also was packaged in a way that allowed as a parent um, uh, a, uh, a different level of engagement I think one of the things that I, I shared with this group last week is the challenge of um, the short bursts of, of, of work that then required lots of parent support and that was structured in such a way that not only was there a video it was paused with questions. There was a worksheet that went with it. There could they could write and draw their observations. It it was it was bundled and done in such a way that it made it a lot easier on the parents as well. Uh, and and this is and I'm you know I do speak English and I don't have some of those other challenges you're mentioning right that that would make it even even that much more difficult. So things like that are great. The discussions uh, at the sixth grade level, um, the discussion boards and getting getting feedback where teachers are chiming right in in a, in a conversation I've seen as a as a, a real positive. Um, you know, I've, I, I know we've had some challenges around the technology on the Zoom side of getting all the kids on our school devices and getting, getting through that. I'm, I'm hopeful we're near, near the end of that because it's obviously frustrating for everybody when you can't get the tech work uh, in, this, in, in, in this world. I wonder if you can explain a little bit though, um, something that I think my, my children don't know how to engage with is this idea of office hours. Um, that kind of comes around in college. You're like, you gotta be a real independent person and they're like, oh, maybe I need to go see yeah. the professor at office hours. My kids are like, I guess that's not time for me. Like they, they, don't, they don't tune into it in the same way. And I imagine a lot of other parents are also thinking, what are we supposed to be doing with that time? Or what is what should we be encouraging as parents for kids to be thinking about then? Um, um, yeah, that would, be really, that would be really helpful. Okay, so, um... First, I want to say that, you know, following the conversation with you, Wendy reached out to her team and not only her team, um, but all the content teams, because each of the teams also has a principal sitting on it to share the suggestion about formatting. And I think that's a good example of the iterative, iterative process that we will start thinking about that, both from an English language perspective, which is another piece of feedback we had from a different person. And so those two things came together and thinking about what the what the importance of the formatting and what that would look like um, from a family perspective and how we could make sure that it's translatable. Um, so thank you for that feedback. That was a, a great example of kind of what we're trying to do as we go forward and get feedback from families. In terms of office hours, um, 
In the guidance that we send home to teachers, it's really detailed. We want teachers to be able to interact in a, inter, in a live way, both for families and, and students. At, at the elementary level, it's probably the most um, confusing, but we structured it specifically on Mondays because we timed the sending out of the learning plans so that we were responsive to feedback from families that some people wanted it over the weekend because they looked at the plans and then mapped out, as you said, their schedules. Some people um, didn't wanna look at it until Monday, but when they looked at it on Monday, teachers noticed we had a lot more email traffic and questions about it. So we thought if we schedule office hours for elementary and first thing on Monday morning, that meets the needs of both um, families who are, you know, have questions right away, but also gives the teachers immediate feedback about what was tricky about the plan that went out um, and enables them the whole week to kind of think about refining that. Office hours are designed for families to be able to ask questions and kids to be able to ask questions and also for teachers to get a sense of uh, opportunity for formative assessment. So it's a way for a student to seek extra help. It's a way for a teacher to convene a small group, um, but it's an expected um, part of our interaction in the sense that we do want kids to show up for office hours and interact with, with the teacher. So I think on the teacher end, we're getting better about thinking about how we bless that in a way, you know, you don't want to be one of six kids showing up to office hours if nobody else is in the room um, or on the discussion board. So reiterating that it's expected and then on the teacher end, thinking about how they send out a prompt that is likely to elicit feedback from, from students. So I, I think that's an area where we have more work to do, um, but it's, it's designed to kind of responds to what are some of the difficulties that kids are having as they try to navigate learning remotely and communicate that we expect that there will be difficulties and the teacher is there to help just as they would be in the classroom with a difficulty. And if I can just follow up uh, really, really quickly, I think one of the pieces you're trying to do is you, it's sort of trying to hit two different needs in, in, in one bucket at a time. One is about particularly at the elementary level helping parents plan. And so Monday morning makes sense. I can imagine the deluge of emails about what do I need to print and all, all how do I get access to the thing? Um, but a second thing is about kids engaging with material. And for from what I see the time, the, the, maybe the, the puzzle here as we continue to evolve is um, my kids haven't yet hit a struggle Monday morning, right? Because it's just the beginning of the week. And so they're not thinking about the planning. The parents are thinking about the plan for the week and they've hit a struggle on sending emails about how to get into things. And by the time we're on to Thursday and you're writing your informative pillar and we maybe have a, have a challenge that feels so, so the timing of thinking about what that looks like, or, you know, as we continue on, there might certainly be issues that roll over from last week that continue on, but um, maybe that's part of some of the confusion about what do you, what do kids use that for um, and how do, how do kids engage? Sure. I want to reiterate too that the office hours is a time where the teacher is on live, you know, monitoring so that you can get a real time answer. But it's certainly huh. not the only opportunity. If there is a time later in the week where a kid has a question, you know, use the old chains of communication and send an email or, or support a student in sending an email because we expect teachers to be responding to email just as they would in any other environment. Um, again, you know, with some notice, understanding that sometimes they get deluged. Um, the only time we really don't have expectations that teachers check email is the weekend. And I certainly would never, I've had very responsive teachers to emails, right? So that, that certainly is happening. I think it's, it's a different structure, you know, office hours. And so I appreciate your sharing a little bit about where you're, where you're trying to develop that into as, a, as another opportunity. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Anyone else have questions or comments? Jason? John does. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, John. No, thanks, Jason. Uh, first off, thank you, uh, Ms. Clowder, for the presentation. Also, a big thank you to our teachers uh, for the creativity and patience, uh, as well as our our parents. All right, this is an adjustment for everybody, right? Um, and I will agree, <laughs> Ms. Clowder mentioned at the beginning of her presentation, St. Patrick's Day feels like a year ago. Um, you know, all I can tell you is that today's Wednesday because I'm on school committee and that's about it. But uh, I would encourage the public uh, to 
go to the uh, Shrewsbury Public Schools website and review the school committee book uh, from tonight's meeting. What Ms. Clowder presented was a sample of, of really the deep content in this book uh, that goes grade by grade to show you what remote learning looks like uh, in under 30 days. Uh, this was on no one's radar uh, on March 10th. We got our school committee booklet on April 10th and I've, I've been reading it since then. And I've really enjoyed going through each grade level to take a look at the type of communication and plans that have been put together. Uh, it's very impressive. Uh, there are a lot of great links to explore uh, to see what remote learning looks like as of today. Uh, we know it's not perfect. Um, and it's, as Ms. Clowder said, it's not uh, meant to replace uh, the work that can be done in the classroom, the interpersonal communication that happens with our students in the classroom. Uh, I know I've said it in previous meetings from my perspective uh, as the parent of an eighth grader uh, and a senior in high school, clearly my children are experienced with Schoology with the one-to-one -one iPad program. So they're used to it. Um, and you know the, the communication that I've seen from teachers uh, is clear, it's concise, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, directional in terms of what needs to be done uh, for the coming week. Oftentimes I see it on Sunday night uh, to prepare them for the week ahead. Uh, but all that said, understandably, uh, you know, I can see you know, the challenges in the elementary level as you call out in the presentation and in the booklet. Um, you know, because the elementary students aren't connected uh, to those tools, uh, certainly not as often as the, uh, the you know, later grades. Uh, but it is impressive. I, I really wanted to call that out and I appreciate all the work that's been done, all the leadership uh, on your part, uh, Ms. Clowder, and uh, everyone within the district. Uh, again, this was not something that anyone planned. Uh, but it has been uh, impressive and we learned from it, right? So uh, I think it's great. Uh, one question I did have, and I think you might have answered it in previous materials, uh, with the 58 or so iPads that have been distributed, obviously I, I, those are within the elementary grades, right? Because five through 12 have one-to-one. -one. Yep. And then, yes. and then, yeah, okay. I just wanted to be, be sure. Um, yeah, no, that's I all I had, but uh, yeah. Um, it's, we're also looking at um, some some families may have one device, but then a lot yeah. a number of children at lower grades. So we're thinking about you know what is the criteria for giving devices out to families, and where do we need hotspots versus devices? And right. I really can't um, acknowledge the efforts of Brian Larue enough. Yeah. Um, between Brian and the principals, they've really been absolutely dogged in following up and how we make sure that as many families ca as can be connected are connected. Great. But thanks Definitely. for that acknowledgement. Our teachers are working really hard. Yeah. That's great work. Thank you so much. Jason. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me just thank you, Amy, and your team for all the work that you've done. I don't want to be too redundant here, but I mean, the scale and the size of what you and your team and all of our staff have done in the preceding weeks has really been astounding. As I've been talking with parents and residents about, you know, what has been going on and, you know, questions along the lines of, you know, why isn't it happening this way? Or, you know, is it easy? You know, colleges do things online. I find myself repeating the phrase a lot. Kindergarten isn't meant to happen on the internet. <laughs> uh, and uh, obviously that's a stark example of it, but uh, what we do in Shrewsbury Public Schools K through 12 is a lot of things that don't necessarily replicate well online and the extent uh, to which you have created a program in a very short window of time that is meeting the needs of students to the best of our ability, uh, I really appreciate. Actually, my question and John, and you just alluded to it just a minute ago, and you've talked about this in some of the materials that you've provided with the committee, but I've been thinking a lot about families for whom access to technology is an issue, uh, whether that be lack of devices at home, whether that be a limited number of devices, and a parent is in a work from home situation and you know needs to use that device maybe for work and isn't able to provide it to their kids. I'm wondering if you could talk for a minute about how the district has worked to address some of those situations with the understanding that obviously each one of those situations might be a bit different. I think that's just it, Jason. I think what we've tried as an approach is to figure out what exactly the barrier is. Um, so in some ways, the barrier is kind of modifying the work expectations or identifying the most important thing. In some cases, the barrier is translation. In some cases, the barrier is the device. Um, in some cases, the barrier is you know, the mental health of the family and the student right now. Um, and it's not the, 
remote learning that's the problem that family's grappling with. And so how do, instead of thinking about why they're not engaging in assigned tasks, how do we support them in terms of their health or their mental health needs? Um, so we don't have a playbook for, this is exactly what we do for every family that's not connecting. I think we have a playbook for how we communicate and who takes the lead in terms of the communication once we know what the barrier is. I'll just add uh, quickly that uh, the inventory that we did and families were responsive to the uh, survey we sent out if they needed a device or connectivity. Uh, we really have triaged this. We started with the families that had absolutely no connectivity or no device access at all at the elementary level. Uh, we've moved into a next phase of families that might be kind of what you characterize, Mr. Palich, around maybe access to, you may have some device, but parents need it for work and that sort of thing. Uh, and so we're uh, now we're looking to go into potentially a third phase where, uh, again, may, maybe not access, but uh, availability of access is an issue. Um, so we're going to keep working that issue and, and make sure that we're trying to provide as much uh, of the resources as possible. I also want to, again, give a shout out to Selco, who is helping us by paying half the cost of iPads with uh, uh, cellular connectivity where families don't have Wi-Fi access. Uh, we've distributed some of those, as I mentioned earlier this evening. Uh, but we'll, uh, we've made a good deal of progress, but there's more to be done and we'll continue to work on that. Thank you both. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Clowder, I just think the work you have done in such a short amount of time is tremendous. When we talk about change management, something to this scale in most businesses does not happen in 25 days. And um, the work you've done is way above and beyond. And everybody on the senior leadership team and the teachers, this is just a tremendous effort for our district. So thank you. And to Brian LaRue and his staff, I mean, IT, without IT, none of this would happen. Um, so that is a that link between education and the, the having IT and the capabilities is just tremendous. So thank you. And I think um, when you talk about the communication, when we look at that pyramid, you know, having that communication with families has improved. People are understanding more about what we're doing, what remote learning is, and it does take time. So um, that is, a, I think that was a good visual for families to have. And, it, you know, looking forward, um, maybe when we're back in session, we're back in school, we're, we're also going to learn new ways to teach and we learn new ways for families to get information. So maybe there's some positive out of this, you know, whole remote learning piece. And I also want to thank families, especially those who um, are working from home and have young children, especially who they're caring for, as well as teaching. And, you know, many of us are not trained educators, and there are families who are learning a lot about teaching now, um, which is good. It's a, it's a great learning experience for both, but I think particularly for young families, this is, this is a lot and a lot of stress on families. So thank you for this very thoughtful way of promoting remote learning. Dr. Sorry, any further comments or questions? No, I, I know it was an extensive amount of information. I really deeply appreciate the work that Ms. Clowder did to pull together the full report, which we'll make available on our website tomorrow morning, um, along with the slides from this evening. Uh, and I do encourage people to read through that and, and click on, many of the links are accessible publicly. Some of them are internal links that, that the school committee had some access to to familiarize themselves and won't be available to the public at large. But uh, the report itself is just very detailed and I agree this, the scale of what's been accomplished um, has been uh, very significant. And I wanna thank all of our educators and, and Ms. Crowder and her curriculum team, the IT team. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, just recognizing again um, that there are areas where we're going to be able to do better uh, as we work through this. Uh, different educators are in different places. Uh, we're working to build as consistent an approach as we can for students and families. Um, and uh, we're on a very steep learning curve and we're going to continue on it. So uh, we, we will continue to be dedicated to providing the best opportunities we can to our students under the circumstances. So thank you and uh, we'll look forward to an update sometime in the not too distant future. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, Mr. Collins will provide an update to the committee on the impact of the pandemic on finances and operations that address payroll continuity for all staff during the school closure period. Okay, so um, <clears throat> obviously we wanna provide a, an update in terms of where we are and some of the financial matters um, if I can advance this on the screen. Uh, 
Pardon me as I go through the slides backwards. Okay, so two topics to cover. Uh, basically where we are with our uh, contract uh, for transportation amendment status and then pay continuity information and recommendation that Dr. Sawyer will make uh, near the end of this presentation. Um, first, in, uh, in terms of the bus contract, um, as we know uh, from the last meeting uh, that this is again a statewide issue. Uh, it's actually a national issue uh, with respect to uh, yellow bus school transportation companies and ensuring their viability um, during the school closure period. So, um, you know, the guidance from both the federal and state uh, governments has been to uh, work with your local provider to provide some sort of uh, contract amendment uh, payment for uh, the uh, bus companies maintaining their fleet, their fleet payments. Um, in being uh, on call and at the ready for when we reopen school. Uh, in terms of Massachusetts, uh, the Department of Education uh, facilitated uh, a system whereby um, school districts were kind of matched up with other school districts who had the same provider. Uh, of course, here uh, in Central Mass, we have uh, in Shrewsbury, we have AA Transportation, which is of course headquartered, headquartered in Shrewsbury. And so um, myself and the business administrator at, for the Wachusett Regional School District are working with the owner to uh, devise some sort of contract amendment on the behalf of uh, 13 different school districts in our area. Uh, so we've had some discussions. We're going to have another one on Friday. And certainly when uh, that becomes uh, near, it's near final form, uh, we'll make sure that we have the proper legal review and then bring it to the school committee for uh, presentation and uh, your uh, vote for approval. Uh, and what would that uh, look like generally is that, um, you know, the, the most, uh, the, the concept of most other school districts who have uh, completed negotiations already is to uh, figure out what the right percentage, less than 100% of the daily rate uh, to maintain the fleet would be uh, for that particular provider. So. Uh, that's an ongoing uh, piece of work uh, right now, and hopefully in the next couple of weeks, that couple of weeks that would be finalized. Moving to the topic of uh, pay continuity for hourly staff, um, this is so certainly uh, an important. Uh, it's a complex and it's a multifaceted uh, topic and issue. It's an important one, and so what we thought we would do is to talk a little bit about how to make that decision because I think people's kind of initial first reaction is, well, just tell us if there's money and if there is, then we'll pay or if there's not, then we won't pay. And I think that there's uh, many more dimensions to this important decision uh, and they're included in this framework. So what we did is we broke out some categories of uh, or dimensions of making this decision. First and foremost is the financial aspect and um, the, you know, decision-making criteria is, um, uh, do we have the money? And looking at this from different dimensions of keeping people on payroll uh, at 100% of their wages, uh, potentially furlough uh, staff, uh, which they would be eligible for unemployment insurance at approximately 50% of their wages, but still retain the rights of employment uh, or layoff, which would be basically terminating their employment. Um, and again, under the uh, current uh, unemployment insurance uh, arrangement, uh, they would receive about 50% of their pay for a certain period of time. Um, so that's the percentage of uh, pay and certainly keeping them on, on payroll would mean providing 100% of their pay. Again, the federal guidance and state guidance uh, for hourly workers who uh, cannot perform their work remotely uh, or to the same degree is to actually keep them on payroll. That's the kind of federal intent is not to just uh, push people onto the unemployment rolls. Um, the financial uh, who pays aspect in terms of uh, if staff were to be furloughed, uh, certainly the unemployment costs for uh, are paid and budgeted for under the town budget. Um, and 
Uh, the town would be responsible for those payments also under a layoff situation. If they continue to be paid, uh, funds would come from the school department budget or special revenue funds. Um, you know, looking at this from a longer term perspective, uh, we need to look at fiscal 21 as well. Uh, and I tried to provide some assignment of an assessment here about um, what the negative impact would be uh, financially, certainly um, the most negative financial strict uh, impact is if we keep people on 100% of pay. Uh, and then uh, kind of a medium impact if they are furloughed or laid off. And it's medium because the town is still liable for 50% uh, of uh, their wages for that certain period of time that they're on unemployment. Uh, so it's not a zero cost uh, scenario. Um, the other piece of the financial aspect is this kind of uh, macroeconomic uh, piece. And again, the federal and state gu guidance uh, is to uh, where it's practical and where uh, employers can, including uh, public school districts, is to keep people on payroll and contributing to uh, the economy and keeping them off unemployment rolls and keeping their health insurance and other benefits intact. The other dimension is uh, mission fulfillment. Um, is, as a school district organization, um, you know, we're, we're concerned about employee productivity and work level. And certainly if we were to lay off or furlough staff, then we would have zero productivity. And if by keeping people on payroll, um, we can have some productivity, whether it be um, uh, professional development online uh, or assisting classroom teachers with remote learning um, and uh, certainly the food service program, which has been mentioned uh, before. The other piece is just the continuity of the educational uh, enterprise uh, and keeping that at the ready for when we do reopen. And certainly uh, if we were to lay off staff and terminate their employment, um, then that jeopardizes the operational uh, services and our ability to come back quickly to uh, reopen school with all the staffing that we need. Certainly a furlough situation is a little bit different they're still uh, on our uh, employment roles and it would take uh, more of a simple communication to bring them back. And by keeping them on payroll, we keep them at the ready and uh, in communication and doing some of those other activities that I mentioned before. Um, other dimensions include uh, certainly valuing our workforce. Um, and you know, in terms of these three different uh, scenarios of furlough, layoff, or keeping on the payroll, you know, of course, um, the employee disruption factor uh, with a layoff is very high. Um, it requires those individuals to go through uh, that bureaucratic system of applying for unemployment insurance. Uh, and we know that that system is stressed right now. Um, the same would be true uh, under a furlough situation. Uh, but certainly uh, employees would retain, again, their benefits um, and, and have those intact. And if we keep people on uh, the payroll, uh, then there's no disruption. So that's just another dimension in terms of making this decision overall. Uh, the other one about valuing our workforce is uh, our employee loyalty based upon the decisions uh, that you make. And I, again, I rated high, medium, low there, depending on what decision gets made from keeping on payroll to layoff to furlough. Um, and then the last two organizational management uh, and the administrative burden uh, based upon these three different scenarios, uh, it's the least burdensome on, uh, administratively to keep people on payroll. Uh, it is the highest administrative burden to uh, lay off staff. And it, al it also is very high if you were to furlough staff. Uh, and what some of those burdens are, again, are to have uh, precise, detailed communications with staff about their status. Um, we would have to respond to uh, each and every single claim of un uh, unemployment insurance because uh, we get tasked with providing wage data for each employee who does file a claim. Um, we would have to go through the rehiring process if we were to lay staff off um, and also, the benefits administration becomes uh, much more cumbersome um, 
an, in a layoff situation, if people were to have benefits, then they become eligible for COBRA, and that needs to be managed as well. And uh, the town is already light on benefits administrative uh, staff. So that uh, is kind of the administrative burden perspective. And then finally is what is the societal viewpoint or political viewpoint or taxpayer sentiment? And that's, that's uh, hard to assess. Uh, and I think we can imagine lots of different reactions based upon the decision that you make for hourly staff and pay continuation under these three different scenarios. So I did wanna spend that amount of time to uh, just elaborate on the different dimensions that go into making this decision. Um, and talk now a little bit about uh, decision-making schedule and just to review that uh, you have already voted twice to uh, continue hourly staff pay. Um, and so tonight uh, is another recommendation that Dr. Sorrell will make at the end of this. Um, and that would be for the time period uh, from April 20th to May 1st. Um, and again, the current, uh, Known information is, is that uh, that's the end of the school closure period as we know it now, and that schools are scheduled to reopen on May 4th, although we know that that has uh, growing de or decreasing uh, uh, likelihood. So um, you have voted already to uh, continue pay through April 17th for all hourly staff, and they'll receive that pay on the April 29th uh, pay period. And again, the decision tonight is for that April 20th to May 1st uh, pay period. We're thinking it's best to continue this decision-making process on a biweekly basis or incremental basis, uh, as opposed to uh, some longer term global uh, decision because the situation continues to evolve rapidly. Um, in terms of the groups, I did wanna break out that uh, the groups into different categories because they are funded differently. And so all of our classroom paraprofessionals, uh, special education aides, ABA technicians, and all of our clerical workers, uh, all of those folks are uh, funded primarily by the town appropriated budget. And we know that that budget is intact for the current fiscal year, and those funds are available uh, in our budget. So I wanted to make sure that both you and the community uh, know that. Uh, a little bit differently is the uh, food service workers. Uh, those employees are funded exclusively uh, from the food service revolving fund. And those monies are uh, of course received by the sale of breakfast, lunch, uh, a la carte items and all of the government uh, reimbursements that we receive from the USDA school lunch program. Um, right now, uh, we know that based upon the beginning year fund balance um, and the costs up through the May 1st uh, pay period, if you were to approve uh, pay continuation, that there is sufficient and adequate funding to pay all of those staff up through May 1st. As a side note, I do wanna make mention of uh, a piece relative to food service and that is, um, the meals support program that we are providing to uh, about uh, 20 to 25 families on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays uh, is similar to what other school districts are doing. Uh, they have there are a lot of different variations of how they're doing it, uh, but the state did get approval from the federal government to make sure that uh, all of those meals are uh, fully reimbursable, um, and that was a special. Uh, authorization that needed to occur. We just got official word on that um, earlier this week. Uh, so we're happy to report that. So every student for whom every student that we hand out one breakfast and one lunch, uh, the government will reimburse to $6.53. The next group of workers uh, or category of workers uh, to talk about is the extended school care uh, group. Uh, again, all of these employees are funded exclusively from the tuitions received by parents paying into that fund uh, to uh, take advantage of that before or after school program. Given the uh, beginning year fund balance and where we are with revenue and expenses at this particular point, 
there is not sufficient funding to uh, from that fund to continue pay up through May 1st. Uh, if the committee decides to do that, uh, it will create uh, approximately $110,000 deficit. Uh, and uh, that uh, monies would have to come from another place, uh, in particular, the operating budget, uh, if that pay were to be continued. This is a slide that I showed at your last meeting. And um, you know, if the committee uh, wishes to continue pay, um, you can see that the estimated savings from school closures for the month of March uh, total uh, just over $20,000. Uh, and that is a result of not having day-to-day -day substitutes and some just general and educational supplies. And that for the month of April, uh, same categories, and then also not having spring sports expenses uh, total up approximately $88,000. So that uh, there's just over $108,000 in savings due to the school closures that could be put towards uh, this effort to for pay continuation for the extended school care workers if you decide to do that. So there is sufficient funding from this fund to pay the, those that group of workers. That's what I just talked about there. And at this point, I would turn it over to uh, Dr. Sawyer uh, for uh, his comments and recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Collins, for the report. Uh, the school committee received a memo random from me under separate cover. I'll just summarize that briefly. Um, I am again recommending that we continue to pay for all district employees for this next two week pay period. Um, as Mr. Collins referenced, uh, we believe it's prudent to go one pay period at a time. Uh, right now, uh, given some of the uncertainty around how long the closure will last, um, this will cover the uh, period we're sure of because uh, the closure will last minimally through May 1st, and that is the last date of the next pay period. Uh, the vast majority of our employees are working remotely. Uh, we know from uh, what Mr. Collins reported that if some number were furloughed or laid off, there would be significant cost shifts to the town budget uh, since the town is self-funded for unemployment insurance. Um, and there would be a significant administrative processing burden as well that we would need to take on that would require time and, and effort and potentially additional money. Uh, we certainly couldn't require any work at home of employees who are furloughed or laid off. And, and so we are deriving a variety of benefits from folks who are working remotely. Um, and uh, although of the one group, the extended school care uh, employees, uh, where that uh, funding source uh, will be exhausted, um, and we'll need to uh, shift uh, the estimate of $110,000 from the appropriated budget to cover that if we pay them through this next two week period. Uh, the savings, as Mr. Collins just reported, um, through April are estimated to be just under that amount of money. So we will have dollars that were not uh, committed to other areas uh, that we could shift to cover those uh, employee costs uh, during this next two week period. Um, the con continuity of pay, of course, uh, keeps our employees financially whole that uh, aligns with the, the guidance we're getting from the state and federal levels uh, that both will help certainly with the economic situation, not only individually, but on a macroeconomic sense. Um, and uh, we'll uh, uh, recognize that uh, uh, that was a helpful thing, certainly for our employees, and we want them available to resume work uh, when uh, we come back out of the, uh, the school closure period. So for all those reasons, I again recommend uh, that you vote this evening. Uh, but to do so incrementally, and there is a, uh, in your packet and on the memo, there is a recommended uh, motion uh, to continue to pay all of our employees for this next two week period uh, that would end on May 1st. And we'd be happy to answer any questions as, as would Mr. Collins at this time. Does the committee have any questions or comments? Just a comment. Sure, Jason. As I've said in prior meetings, I support this recommendation. I support continuing to pay our staff to the uh, for the time that we're able to do so. I think that it is the moral thing to do. I think it's the right thing to do to continue to pay our staff. And in terms of what the community wants, I don't think that our community wants to see right now people being laid off uh, without income unnecessarily. So I think that in addition to feeling as a school committee member that this is the right thing to do if we value our staff, I think from a community perspective, from what I'm hearing and from what I'm sensing, uh, I think that the community wants to see people remain gainfully employed. Uh, so I support the recommendation before us this evening. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Mr. Collins, could you take the slideshow off so that we could see all the members? Oh. 
Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. There we go. Anyone else have any comments or questions? Dale. I, I think the uh, every two week approach makes a lot of sense. I think the situation is so fluid. We don't know when school is gonna resume. And in addition, I think sooner or later, we're gonna, we may cross a point where we don't see the money in the budget to pay people. And uh, we also have to know what kind of money is gonna be coming from the federal government and from the state. And those things change from day to day. We, you know, if it's at all possible, uh, we want to continue uh, paying our employees, but it, the, the components of the decision are gonna change week by week. And so I think this is a very good approach. Excellent. Anyone else? Lindsay? I'm also certainly in favor of, of this approach. No one, no one wants to be here even having this conversation, of course, but uh, to do this on a, um, on a pay period by pay period basis until we have some better facts in front of us uh, to help us plan slightly longer term, uh, certainly it's the, it's the right thing to do for right now. Thank you. John? Yeah, I agree with my colleagues. Um, our most valuable asset is our people, is the personnel that uh, comes to work every day. And, and as you could see, even from tonight, you could see there's a lot of work going on. So I do support the approach and I support the recommendation. Okay, thank you. I also support this recommendation. I think um, the it is a fluid process, like Dale said, so we have to continually look at it. I think in increments, it's, it's a better method, but I do think we also have to recognize um, that the budget, you know, probably next year could be difficult or more difficult than we anticipated. So, you know, we want to make sure we can retain anything that we can put forward to next year as well. So, I think that has to be um, part of our thinking as we move forward with this. So anything further from the committee? No. You may have a motion to approve the continued compensation of all Shrewsbury Public School employees through at least May 1st of the mandated school closure for the COVID-19 pandemic, including both salaried and hourly employees at their contractual rates of pay based on their typical time worked per pay period. So moved. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. A roll call voice vote. Dale. Jason? Uh, I think Dr. McGee might be muted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> John? Aye. Aye. I'll figure this out. Lindsay? Aye. Myself, I Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have our minutes from our school committee meeting held on April 8th, 2020. Are there any changes or corrections? I don't see anyone. Okay, those can be marked as accepted as distributed. Okay, so if there's nothing further, we do know, need to go into executive session this evening for the purpose of negotiations with some or all of the following, the Shrewsbury Education Association Unit A, Shrewsbury Education Association Unit B, the Shrewsbury Paraprofessional Association, the Shrewsbury Cafeteria Workers, and or non-represented staff where deliberation in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and for the purposes of reviewing, approving and or releasing executive session minutes. And we will return to open session only for the purposes of adjourning for the evening. I have a motion. So moved. Second. second. Moved and second, roll call vote. Dale. Aye. Jason. Aye. John. Aye. Lindsay. Aye. Myself. Aye. Thank you and good night.